Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome everyone. We are starting a new book today, inshallah, having finished with um, studying the Murshid Mu'in of Ibn Ashir. And that was obviously covering the full breadth of the three sciences of this deen, the three main sciences being aqidah and fiqh and tasawwuf. We are now going into a text that is dedicated specifically to aqidah to the science of Usuluddin, to the science of Tawheed. So without further ado, I would be like Mr. Shalom Raji, Mismillahi Rahman Rahim, wa salatu wa salam wa ala khayri al mursaleen, wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in, wa la hawla wa la quwwata illa billahi al-ali al-azim. Subhanakallahumma la ilma lana illa ma'allamtana innaka anta al-alim al-hakim. So first a little bit of background about the text that we have chosen. We have chosen the Jawhar Tawheed which was written by one of the great Maliki ulama of around 400 years ago of Egypt. This is a place called Laqqan, which is one of the towns in Egypt. And uh, Imam Burhanuddin Ibrahim ibn Hassan, al-Maliki, al-Laqani, he was from Laqan, was the man who wrote this particular manzuma, which is like a didactic poem, similar to Ibn Ashir. But this one is a much shorter poem. It's 144 lines instead of the 317 lines of Ibn Ashir. And um, he was a great man of knowledge, not just of this particular science, the Usul al-Din, but of fiqh, um, hadith. In fact, he was known as a Bahar in hadith. And he was known as the man to go to in Egypt when you had tricky issues, tri tricky fiqh issues. People couldn't really unlock them. People would come to him and ask him for help in unraveling that particular conundrum, whatever it was, when it comes to fiqh, and to give lots of fatwas. So he, he was a man who people, did, people asked for fatwas. But at the same time, he was a man of tremendous hiba. He was, he, had, he was a jalali, majestic man. So very few people could summon up the courage to actually speak to him directly, because he, he, he had a sort of thing of fear, when people came to him, they, their fear of Allah almost overcame them because he was a man of state, a man of tarbiyah. He was actually a sheikh of tarbiyah as well, a sheikh of tasawwuf. Mm -hmm. And so uh, very few people could, would summon up the courage. So the people who asked were very serious. And so the questions that came, so he hasn't got a lot of things that he's written down because he focused on what was serious and what was needed. Um, so one of the main things that he wrote was this particular manvuma, this text, on Aqidah, but he also wrote a, a gloss, a hashia on the Mukhtasar of Khalil. And one of the problems I think of his time was smoking that he didn't particularly approve of. So he wrote something warning people about the effects of smoking and how, how, how terrible it was. But he, he didn't write a, a huge number of, of things. But what he did, he wrote concerning what he saw as being needed. And as we're going to come to, the need for this, he saw, was partly because of the fact that there were huge compendia of books that were written on this topic, and it was becoming inaccessible to most Muslims to even access, access the science of Usul al-Din. You know, like somebody who, uh, the first time he comes to run, he's presented with a marathon. He's going to say, oh, I'm not going to do this. But if you give him like 50 meters to run, he'll think, okay, I can do that. So in the same way, he saw that the scientists or the people of knowledge of this particular science had put such barriers in people's way by making it so complicated and so much information that it needed to be simplified and made easy for people. Mm. This is one of the purposes of this text. He studied with many of the great scholars of his time. And as I said, he was about 450 years ago. So he was, he was, he was born in 970 and he died in 1041, somewhere around that point. So it was this teaching of his was on the cusp of a thousand Hijri when it was uh, this was a um, thousand years after the Hijrah of the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So quite a, well, quite a time ago now, but not sort of one of the early scholars. He was one of the later the Khalaf, later scholars. He studied with some of the great scholars of Egypt of the time, uh, as Sanhuri, al Qarafi, amongst others, very famous scholars of the time. And um, he lived most of his life in Egypt, but he died on the way to Hajj, very close to the coast of the, of the Red Sea when he was on his way to Hajj, around the age of 70, um, in the month of Safar, just before Asia, and he was taken back to Ayla, a, a, a town 
of on the border of, of Egypt, there near the Red Sea, where he was where he's buried today. Um, this Johara of Tawheed is dedicated to the sciences of Tawheed of Kalam. You might have heard the word Kalam. This refers to this particular way of describing Tawheed, of going into the intricacies of Tawheed and the proofs therein. He was basing this on the teaching of Abu al-Hasan al-Ash'ari, who is a very, very famous early Muslim scholar around 260 AA Hijri, who um, was brought up in the Mu'tazili school which is often translated as the rationalists, people who thought that, you know, our, our own viewpoints and the way that our minds work and how we can decide whether something's illogical or not can then be projected onto Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we measure the people who started measuring Allah according to their own reason, what they thought was reasonable. The Mu'tazili. So he came into a time when the Mu'tazili were strong, Mu'tazila, and also the Falasifa, the philosophers, who had taken Greek philosophy and adopted some of the ideas of it and tried to insert them into the way that the Muslims viewed the world and the, into their aqidah. So, for example, they had a viewpoint that the world had been here forever, which they talk, took from Greek philosophy and so on and so forth. So some of these types of viewpoints were very prevalent in his time. And on the other side, there were those who rejected all of this. And they wanted to go back to the Athari, just go back to the to the sources, the Athar, and not give any interpretation of them whatsoever, which was in fact the way that the early communities believed. They didn't go into all of these proofs that they were done by the later ones. But the problem is, at the time that he came in, there were already all of these sorts of arguments and proofs out there, and they were confusing people. So you would just simply say, no, those proofs are not accurate, it's this way. It wasn't compelling to people. Because people were, you know, if somebody made you a compelling argument about something, they would listen to those people. And if somebody else said, no, 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 it's just Allah has a hand or Allah has a, that's it, that's the way we leave it, for example. Without explaining something of that, it, you know, was not very compelling for the masses. Mm. So he had, to, he had to come up with a way of making some arguments to destroy the arguments of those who had come with these rationalist viewpoints. So basically, he was in the Mu'tazili, and in Ramadan, um, one year, when he was around the age of 40 or so, he um, had a dream of the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, where the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa came to him three times in that month. This is Abu al-Hasan al-Ashari. Mm. The first time, the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, said that he, should, he wanted him to Go back to the hadith, basically. Go back to my hadith. Rely on my hadith. Um, and he didn't quite understand what the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu meant that first time. So the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu came to him in a second time and told him to support the hadith. And so he basically then understood that this to mean that he should stop doing kalam. He should stop overanalyzing and simply go to what the hadith said about the things that we believe in. And so he forswore Kalam. He said, I'm not, long, I'm not going to get involved in these sorts of things anymore. And the messenger then, and so he just went on and he just then started to base everything purely, like in the beginning of the Risala, he just mentioned all of the hadith that talk about the belief and all of the um, Quranic ayats that talk about belief, and that was it. But the messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi came to him in a dream a third time and told him that he did not want him to leave Kalam. This came on the 27th night. He just wanted him to base the kalam on real sources rather than purely on an untethered mind that has no connection to the original sources. So this became his life's work to break down the viewpoints of, of, of the Mu'tazili, those who were making all of these claims based on what they thought was reasonable, and the Falasifa, those who were introducing all of these ideas from outside of Islam that were also based on, on people's rationalist viewpoints of how they viewed things. And also, the other side, the people who started to declare that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had a body and things of this nature, because they were literalists. They would take what was said in the hadith and the Quran, and they would say, Allah says it, Allah doesn't lie, it has to be true, so Allah has a hand, but without realizing the way that language works. 
I mean, the way that language works is that sometimes some things that are, that are metaphorical are actually the core usage of something. Mm. For example, if you say Baina Edikum in Arabic, between your hands, literally, that's never used to mean that something is actually being held in between somebody's hands. That's not the core usage. The core usage is always in front of you. Baina Edikum simply means in front of somebody. Min khalfikum, behind somebody. And there's plenty of things like that. In the Quran, for example, was alul qarya. It's a shorthand that people do. Ask the village. Ask the town. Is a town something that can be asked things? Can it be speak? Hmm. No, so obviously that's a form of metaphor or an elided word. Ask the people of the town. So that's a common thing in language. So in order to take something literally, you still have, you still have to understand how language works and what's meant by particular usages of language. So there's always some degree of interpretation. So he forged the middle way. You don't take things simply as they are stated literally. You don't overuse your mind. And this was the science of Kalam, and he was basically one of the forebears of, of this. And the vast majority of the people of this, of this uh, Sun, Ahlus Sunnah, the people of Sunnah, the people who are following the way of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu have adopted this way of viewing Aqidah. There's the Maturidiyah as well, very similar, but these, this particular way of using Kalam to look, at, look into the things that we believe in, basing that Kalam on sound sources is, is the way that nearly all of the Muslims do it today. And it basically, it started with this man, Abdul Hassan al Ashari. He was the first person who saw the need of it. Um, and we, it doesn't mean to say we believe anything different from the early generations, not at all. But it was a tool that was needed to, to fight all of the, 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 the false and new viewpoints and the misunderstandings that were coming from outside. And we have this today. We have the atheists and all these other peoples who, all these the 73 sects, <laughs> you know, the Islam will, will go into, will fall into 73 sects, only one of them being right. That's referring to these sorts of false beliefs that people start to entertain and start to think that, that is how the reality is. When there's only really one truth. And um, we try and approach it through the Quran and the Sunnah, but using some amount of intellect because it's a tool that we've all been given to use. So we use it, but in a healthy way. And as was indicated by Ibn Ashir, when we studied that, he says, one of the core things upon which we take our deen, the Aqd al-Ashari, according to the Aqidah, you have us usul al deen you have the science of Kalam, you have the science of Tawheed, you have Aqidah, all of them refer to the same thing. So the Aqd al-Ashari, the beliefs of al-Ashari, the Aqidah, the doctrines of, of uh, belief formulated by Imam al-Ashari. So this is what this text is, is dealing with, that particular same current is following the same current. Moving on to this poem before us, the Jawahar Tawheed. As I said, its purpose is to convey these teachings that were, you know, put forward by Imam al Ashari and then purified and sorted by all of the people who came after him. So it's, you know, it's, 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 it's with an isnad from the people of knowledge who have, who have held on to this teaching. And it's offered to us in a way that we have access to, in a shorthand. Mukhtasar, shortened, abbreviated style that we can all grasp, but that we can all comprehend the scope of it without being frightened of that scope. So moving on to the start of it, the first thing he does, as with all great works, and this happened with Ibn Ashir, if you, will, if you remember as well, what is the first thing that is done when you embark upon an action of importance? Yeah, so the very first thing, because that is the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opens his book in terms of before you start Quran, you say Bismillahir Rahman Rahim. Although we don't follow the Shafi'i position that Bismillahir Rahman Rahim is part of the Quran, whenever you embark on Quran, the first thing is Bismillahir Rahman Rahim. So that was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's guidance to us. So with the same thing here, we start with Bismillahir Rahman Rahim. And there is ijma' amongst all the ulama that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
um, uses these terms either as part of the book or before any of the books that were revealed. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Not just Bismillah, the best form of, of the Basmala, of saying in the name of Allah. I'm going to come to what is meant in the name of Allah in a second. The best way is Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In or with the name of Allah, the Rahman, the all-merciful, one whose mercy reaches everybody, the most merciful, the one whose mercy reaches the believers, the one they say that the Rahman refers to the mercy in this world, which is one out of a hundred parts. <laughs> and the 99 parts are reserved for the Rahim, for the ones who, the, who receive the Rahmah of the Rahim in the next world, which is the Muminun. So Bismillah rahman rahim And also the Messenger of Allah, so as, as I said with Ibn Ashir, said in a very famous hadith, Kullu amrin dhi balin. Um, or um, the, the, the various different ways that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam expressed this. Um, abtar as well was another one, cut off, like when somebody is abtar, they have no children. All of these ones all mean the same thing, that it is devoid of any barakah. If you have a matter, and by matter here, he means anything that is acted upon, or anything that is written down or spoken. So all of those can be matters and amr. The bal of importance, something that has that's significant, not something everyday and mundane, like stepping your shoes on, for example. Although there are everyday things that we do say the Bismillah ar Rahim, like when we eat, when we enter a mosque, and so on and so forth. But it doesn't refer to absolutely you don't have to say Bismillah ar Rahim every single act you embark upon every step you take, every breath you take. It refers to more the matters of significance. So every matter that has any significance that is not started with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, in the name of Allah, the All-Merciful, the Most Merciful, is devoid of good and will not be something that brings you success ultimately, whatever it brings you in this world. So I suppose even if you take it with food, you know, if you want that food to sustain you and, and allow you to do worship and bring you closer to Allah, start by saying Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim and so on. But this applies specifically to these types of acts, things that you want their benefit to extend beyond you to other people. So, uh, for example, Imam Al-Nawawi mentioned that, uh, you know, whenever you are writing a book or whenever you're in a class teaching people, where people are going to be taking from you. Or even if you are in a class as a student and the teacher asks you to read something out, it is recommended, highly recommended, that you start whatever you are going to do with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. This is one of the secrets to knowledge and the access to knowledge and the giving of knowledge. It also doesn't refer to things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has designated a way for them to start. We don't, even if a matter is important, like the prayer, it's a very important matter. Do we start it with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim? No, we start the prayer with Allahu Akbar, because that's the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wrote it. And similarly, things that are forbidden, even if they seem to have a significance, for example, you're about to go and rob a bank or something, <laughs> You don't embark upon that with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim because it's a disrespect to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be disobeying him and then saying you're doing it in his name. So then he, um, the, as I mentioned in the Ibn Ashik classes, this hadith, Kullu amrin di barin la yubda'u fihi bi Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, there's another version of it that says bihamdillah or bilham, bilhamdulillah, Every matter of importance that is not begun with Alhamdulillah has no good in it, is cut off. And there's another version that says, Bisalati al Nabi, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Every every hadith, every, every matter of importance that is not begun with Salat al Nabi is cut off in good. So how can you start with three different things? How does that work? Surely starting means only starting with one thing. So the way they explain this is there's two types of ways of starting. We use the word ibtida in Arabic, beginning something in two ways. One, we use it in its absolute sense that means that there's nothing before it. And that refers to Bismillahirrahmanirrahim in this matter. 
And the second means that it's ibafi, it starts before the action at hand. In other words, it's done before the action upon which you are to embark. It's not the very first thing, but it's done before the action. In other words, the action has, starts with that thing having been done. And that's Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen and the Salat al nabi They are done before the embarking upon the action. So you'll see often with a lot of these works, they will say Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen at the beginning of them and the Salat al nabi And then afterwards they'll come to Amma Ba'd or Wa Ba'd or whatever it is. You'll see that in khutbas as well. All of these things are done before you get to the topic at hand, which is often started by amma ba'd to indicate a change of, from the preliminaries to the thing that you that you have intended as your course of action. Is that clear? So, bismillah in the ism bi bismillah. What is meant here by the ba? There's there's two differences of opinion. One is that the ba is meaning isti'ana. You're saying bismillahirrahmanirrahim in the sense that I seek help with the name of Allah. So in other words, it's a form of dua. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. And the other one is musahaba. You're doing this thing alongside the ism of Allah. So you're putting Allah's name alongside the act that you're doing in the hope that the barakah from the name of Allah will rub off on your action. Because it just starts, Bismillah, with the name of Allah. So with means alongside, usually. So the name of Allah is there, and then your action is there. So that's one possible interpretation. Um, the other one is that it is asking for help by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that means then that the ism is simply the, the same as the thing that is named. By the ism of Allah, you simply read Allah. I'm asking help by Allah. You're not asking his name, help from his name. You're asking help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Like so in a sense, if you look at these two ways of thinking it, then you can see that in the bih itself is an understanding of the entirety of tawheed in some ways. Because bih means that nothing can happen except that you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, meaning all good comes from him and there is no other source of it. And also that... Um, with alongside Allah, where everything is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, nothing, nothing, nothing is, is, is away from him. Everything comes with him, alongside him, and is not, is, it has no, it's all from his qudra. I mean, the, the bih specifically, though, is usually interpreted by most in this case to mean asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's help. Because some say that it's not good adab with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to place his name alongside our works as if they are on a similar level. So there's been different points about that. Alhamdulillah. So the first line of the poem itself now. So he starts, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Then, Alhamdulillahi ala silatihi. So we have salatihi in the second part of this. And silatihi in the first part. Alhamdulillahi ala silat, silatihi. So, what does that mean? Alhamdulillah, praise be to Allah. First, alhamd. Praise is basically um, speaking well, saying something good of somebody in order to raise them, uh, to, to venerate them, to. Um, because of something beautiful that they have within them that is not intrinsic necessary to them, but it's because of something that they are maybe doing or doing for you. So for it might be a favor to you, for example, somebody is generous to you. So you say, what a wonderful guy that guy is. He's very generous. That's an example of praise because of something that he's done for you. Or if you see somebody praying, you say, what a wonderful slave of Allah that person is. He's not doing anything particularly for you, but he's doing something that uh, you consider worthy of, that is good in your eyes, so you, you speak well of him, which is praise. There's a difference between hamd and what's called madh, by the way, which is another word in Arabic used for praise, because you can praise something for some, uh, you can say madh for somebody, uh, for something that's intrinsic to them. For example, their good looks. You can say, wow, he's such a good looking guy. That's madh, but it's not hamd, because hamd refers to good things that are done by people that are not intrinsic to their created nature, in a sense. 
So, I mean, in a sense here, Alhamdulillahi ala silatihi. We, we praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for everything. This say alhamd here, praising to Allah, us speaking well of Allah. When you say alhamdulillah, what does al mean here? There's three opinions here. Al means all. It covers everything, every type of praise, all praise. When you say the, the man, for example, in certain, the human being, the human being walks on two feet. You mean all human beings walk on two feet. So that's one way of saying that. It means all, all praise is the last. And in, in, in other words, even when I um, praise you, in a sense, I'm praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because all praise is his. There is no praise for anyone but him. That's al with the meaning of all. Then there is al with the meaning of something that is known in the eyes of the, in the ears of the listener. For example, I'm telling you a story. I said a man and a dog were in China. The man, the, that usage of the there refers back to the story I was just telling. So it's something that's known to you. So this, in a sense, could mean that the praise that is known that we know of, the way of praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there's known. In other words, the way that the messengers and the prophets showed us of how to praise Allah. Alhamdulillah. Or the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praised himself. That's when we say alhamdulillah in that sense. That is what we could be referring to if you take al to mean that. And al also with the meaning of jinns means all types of praise. Everything that can constitutes praise. Whatever constitutes praise is Allah's. So there's the three types of al there. And all of them belong to Allah. So even whichever one of them we are referring to, it, ref it's, it's, it refers to Allah's man. It belongs to him. All praise is his. Whether I'm praising anything else, it's truly praise for Allah, or whether um, I'm using the praise mentioned by the prophets, this all belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ala silatihi. Asilat. Have you heard of silat al rahim? Which is often translated as maintaining the ties of kinship. Sila meaning a connection sometimes. But here, the word sila means atiya. It's the main meaning of from, from sula, which is a gift or the act of giving. That is what sila means in essence. So when you're doing sila to rahim, you're giving to your family. You're supporting your family. You're giving them either your presence or you're giving them presents. So Allah silatihi, he means for the ni'am, for the gifts, for the blessings that he's given us. Praise belongs to Allah for the blessings that he's given us. So why has he specified it for, why is he saying the praise is due to Allah for the blessings, rather than simply leaving it general? Praise belongs to Allah for everything, in a sense. Because when, Allah, when somebody does something for you, it's a debt that you have to repay. And repaying a debt is an obligation. So it is obligatory on every one of us, when we are blessed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to praise him for that blessing. And as we know from the deen, what is obligatory is higher in the eyes of Allah than what is mandub. So a praise that is obligatory is a higher act than a praise which is recommended. So praising Allah for the blessings in, a, in one sense is, a high, is higher than praising him in a generic way. Because you're fulfilling what you have to do. That's one of the reasons why they say he mentions the salati. Also, of course, it's for the meter of the poem. But that's, that's, there's nothing that's extraneous. When they choose these words that they put in these poems, they do it for a reason. And there's all, these, are, these are great men of knowledge. You know, they're not going to just choose random words when they were composing these things. They're going to think very carefully about what they... And he composed this all, by the way. He had an inspiration and composed it all in one night, this particular poem. And he wrote three shuruh. Three commentaries on it himself. Thumma, so that's the first, alhamdulillah. Thumma, salamullahi ma'a salatihi. Then the salam of Allah, literally the, the greetings of Allah, the peace of Allah. The salam Allah here is referring to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's tahiyya, his greeting of his Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, which his salam, his greeting to his messenger, befits his station. 
And as we know, the station of, uh, of the Messenger of Allah is the highest of anything in existence because he's the pinnacle of existence. He's the highest created being. So the salam of Allah will be higher still because of that. There's, there's you know, how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks of him. And they say that the salam of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala telling his Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa of all the things that are in his, in his book, the divine book, uh, uh, that, that talk of his elevated station, which is, we know that that's referred to in many things. So his salam is, is telling his messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa these things in a sense, unveiling that part of his kalam to his Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa and this from us, by the way, is a dua. We are asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give salat to the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and salam to the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Usually, as in the ayah, ya ladhina amanu, inna allahu wa malaikatahu yusalluna ala nabi, ya ayyuhu ladhina amanu sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima, Allah and his angels do salat on the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, oh you who believe, do salat on the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and salim or taslim and, and greet him with taslim or call down peace with taslim on him. What comes first? Salah. salah. So there's some people who say, well, why does he say mention Allah's salam before his salah here? Obviously, there's the reason of the meter of the poem. But in order to counter that, what word does he use here? Thumma salamullahi ma salatihi. With so it's often the case in language that if you want to refer to the more important person, you have him after with. So the Chamberlain went to the market with the king in the entourage of the king. So in a sense, the Salah is referred to second, even though it's the first one, because then he gets around that by using Ma alongside in that same way that we often do that in language. So the Salat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have the salam, which is, in a sense, his greeting, him talking about the Messenger of Allah, so one of the most elevated and vener venerating of ways. Then the salah is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is, as, as we know from the hadith, means Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's rahmah. Because salah, when it's from Allah, is his mercy. Salah, when it's from the angels, is their istighbar, is their asking for forgiveness for the saints of Allah. And salah, for people, is dua. So when we say Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we're not saying we are giving that salat to him. We are asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give his salat to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So salat from us is, is, is dua. In fact, that's a synonym for salat. So the word prayer is often used to mean, even in English, to mean supplication. So um, in this particular case, we start with Hamd before the Salat on the Mir because it's customary to begin with the Musabib, the causer, and give praise to the causer, which is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, before we then give it to the cause, the immediate cause of these blessings coming to us, which is the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So he says next, Alan Nabi, Alhamdulillahi, Ala Salatihi, Thumma Salamullahi Ma Salatihi, Alan Ala Nabi Yin, on a prophet. Why does he say a prophet here and not the prophet? Because when you say a of something, you mean that that person has absorbed everything that it means to be that. That word then becomes synonymous with, that, with him. He is Nabi. When you think of the word Nabi, you think of, the, of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He embodies everything that it means to be a Nabi. In a sense, when you leave something indefinite like that, it's almost a greater level of, of, uh, of praise. Because you're saying that simply by saying a word that has a very elevated meaning for the word Nubuwa 
going to either come from Nebat, which is the, the, the message, the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the, the news from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or from Nubuwa, which means rifa'ah, which means elevation. And you're saying that the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, if we say a prophet, everybody knows we're referring to him. If you say a something and, you, and everybody knows who it's referring to, that shows the, the status of that person. Do you get that? Hmm. So sometimes when you refer to somebody in the indefinite, you see, it elevates them further than even using the definite. Ala nabiyin and a nabi is different from a rasul, although the, although the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was both rasul and nabi. A nabi is somebody who receives revelation and uh, the main the main people of uh, of of the deen are except that it has to be a man there are some who say some women have been prophets but the strongest position is that it was a, is a, a man human being there are no prophets from from the jinn according to the majority the prophets are from the humans um and they have received revelation and they are commanded to act by that revelation, but they are not commanded to convey it. Not necessarily. Sometimes a Nabi is a Rasul as well, in which case he is commanded to convey. But the word Nabi does not indicate any command to convey the revelation that he receives, although he is commanded himself to act by it. That is a Nabi. And there are said to be, according to different reports, 224,000 or 124,000 prophets that have come in existence. Sometimes he, these huge numbers simply mean that there have been a lot. Whereas the numbers for messengers is 313 or 314 or 315, which is far less. Often you will find that they are, a prophet will come after a messenger. So you will have like the Banu Israel, they will have had their messengers, Sidna Musa, for, who brought the message. And then the prophets that came after were not commanded to abrogate that message. They were simply affirming it, although they they did receive revelation themselves. They were not commanded to abrogate the message that Sidna Musa salam, brought. They were just to make sure that people continued to be on the right path. Because, you know, these are the highest of all of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's people. That's another meaning of the word Nabi, that they are above everybody. So when you see these people, it reminds you of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, just like when we spend time with the Shu. And it keeps the community rightly guided, having these people amongst them. If you simply had the messengers and then never had the, the, the prophets afterwards, then particularly those people who were given to rebel, they would swiftly leave the tariq, the, 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 the path. With us, the messenger of Allah, sallam's, one of the main miracles was the fact that his message <coughs> Allah was going to be protected until the end of time. And he did that by means of the Quran being preserved in the hearts of men and by means of the ulama being the warathatul anbiya, the people of knowledge of this community being the inheritors of the prophets, having a similar status to them in being able to keep this thing alive and current amongst the people. So this ummah has been protected. But as we're going to come to shortly, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu was the final prophet. Mm. So he says, Allah Nabiyin, a prophet, Ja'a bi Tawheedi. He brought Ja'a bi, came with him, brought it with him, a Tawheed. Tawheed literally is the um, declaring of the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or believing in the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But also he, he brought people the teaching of Tawheed. Of, how, of, 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 of the unification, the doctrines of unification, of how to see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was one. This was the, in fact, if you look at the Quran, the majority of the early ayats of the Quran were talking about Tawheed. This was one of the main things that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam brought. And he did it in a time when, which he mentions here, وَقَدْ خَلَ الدِّينُ عَنِ التوحيد. In a time when deen, when the, 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 what people thought of as religious religion, of what they base their life on, the teachings they base their life on, had become bereft of Tawheed. Oneness was no longer a part of their central belief system anymore in the time the Messenger of Allah came. And the, the people who have interpreted this said 
that what he means by this is that the messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was the first prophet or messenger who came at a time when the belief systems themselves no longer had tawheed. In other times, the belief systems still had tawheed. People were simply not following them. But the belief systems were still there. The messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came in a time when in the essential doctrines of belief of the time that he came, the central doctrines were contrary to tawheed. They, they believed in these idols, for example, in, in amongst Quraysh. The Christians had their doctrine of the Trinity. And he mentions, uh, you know, the Jews having this belief that Uzair ibn Allah, Uzair was the son of Allah. So that was referring to, even amongst, even amongst the Jews, many of these doctrines had become corrupted. So that their deen themselves, what they thought of was the pure thing to be followed, was not correct anymore. It couldn't be found. So the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi came in a time when that was the case. People were saying, no, our deen is that there is this Lat and Uzza, or whatever, these idols, and you are corrupting our deen by calling to other than them. You know, this was often the response that he Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam got. Not that, uh, okay, yeah, we know, yeah, but we, we're doing our own thing, but, but uh, you know, or simply a lack of deen. They actually thought that it was correct to believe in these things and incorrect to believe in the oneness of Allah, these people. So he came at a time where it was quite shocking to them to tell them that there is only one, oh, one, one God. Everything that happens, he's the one who causes it to happen. He causes people to die. He brings them back to life. All of these things were quite shocking to them because they ascribed power to all of these intermediaries and thought that they were vital to the, the way that the, the thing worked. So he says, This, uh, this uh, salat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we ask for this salat and this salam to be on a prophet. And who is this prophet? He is the prophet who came at a time of tawheed, who came with tawheed when, there was no, when, when the deans of that time no longer had tawheed. What did he do? فَأَرْشَدَ الْخَلْقَ لِدِينِ الْحَقِّ So this word irshad, has two different meanings. It can mean simply to point the way to somebody, or it can mean to cause somebody to become rightly guided. So it can refer to the result, or it can refer to the action of trying to get people to, to, to get to that result. So Arshad, that can mean you have made them become Rashid, you have made them become rightly guided, or it can mean you are pointing them in the direction of right guidance, whether they get there or not, we don't know. So they say that the most likely meaning of Arshada here is pointing them in the right, because not everybody became rightly guided. Arshada al-Khalq, what is the Khalq? Literally creation. But and that, this actually does indicate that the messengers in some way are sent to all, all, all of existence. But the only, the only ones who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given the amana to, the choice in a sense, to, to follow him or not, are men and jinn. The thaqalain, the two weights, the two heavy groups, men and jinn. So the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi was really sent, when it comes to responsibility to follow him, to men and jinn. And he was sent to them, to arshadahum, to point them in the direction of deen al-haq. The deen of, not of truth here, the deen of Allah. The deen of al-haq, one of the names of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. So in this particular, sometimes al-haq is used specifically to refer to Allah. But if he said lid-deen al-haq, you would expect it to mean the truth, the, the deen of truth. But here it could mean the, the deen of truth, or it could mean the deen of Allah. But the, the, the sharih, um, al-bayjuri, who was talking about this, said he refers, refers it to refer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He was sent to call them back to the deen of Allah, and not all the deen of all of these funny things that they had they had invented. So they were calling, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi came to guide them back to the deen of Allah. How did he do this? Be safe he, with his sword. Wa had ye he, and his guidance, um, lil haq. So this safe and had ye he referred to two things, jihad and dawah. 
jihad and da'wah were the two primary ways by which the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam called people lil haq. In this case, it's the truth. Calls people to what was true and real and away from what was false and unreal. He mentions safe first, sword, even though obviously you can't actually physically guide somebody with a sword. It means that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used the sword to fight people, to get them to guide us. But he, he uses it first to, elevate, to show how high jihad is in the eyes of Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala, how important it is. It's such an important, vital component of this deen. You know, being so protective and so desirous of Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala's word being uppermost that you even are prepared to put your own life at risk in order to enable that to happen. But it wasn't obviously the first way that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did this. It started initially purely with da'wah, with reciting Quran, with telling people. And in fact, that whenever when you look in the books of jihad, whenever you come to fight jihad, the first thing you are required to do this, this applies if you come to a people with whom you, are, you have not already been fighting for years. Obviously, if you've been fighting for years with a group of people, and if you give them time by, by calling them to Islam, they will simply come around and attack you in a new way. That's one, that's one thing. But you, when you come to a new place, and the first thing you are required to do is to invite them to Islam and to give them some time to respond, whether it's an overnight or however it is, however long. And sometimes it can be longer than that. Maybe sometimes it might even be three days. So you call people. But this, this whole thing started in Mecca, obviously, was simply calling people. Jihad came later. He mentioned jihad first purely because it is elevated station in the deen. So you call people first. Then if they don't respond, then you threaten them with war. If they, and, and you, you call them to Islam and you offer them the jizya, or you say pay the jizya. If they don't respond to either of that, then you threaten them with war and then you physically fight them. It's not, it's not about, again, jihad is not about killing the people. It's simply about opening them up so that the deen can be established in their land, because you can, can't force somebody to become Muslim with a sword. Mm. Simply about opening up the place so that they can better see the justice that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has teach, he, the, the teaching that he gave his messenger brings in this and make it easier for them to become Muslim. فأرشد الخلق لدين الحق بسيفه وهديه هديه again similar similar meaning to إرشاد guidance can mean sometimes right guidance and can mean sometimes the act of guiding somebody it's very similar to إرشاد محمد العاقب للرسل ربه so now it's starting in the thing um, this, by, by the way, you could either say Muhammadin or Muhammadi here, ala nabiyin Muhammadi, so it's referring back to the Nabi. It's uh, sort of a, an, what's called in Arabic an atf bayan, a conjunction of explanation. In other words, by Nabi, we mean Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Al-aqib lirusli rabbihi. So this salat that we've been talking about is due to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Who is Muhammad? Muhammad, and who gave the name Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Mm -hmm. There's differences of opinion about this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, some people say it was his grandfather, chose that name for, for, for him. Others have said it was his mother and she had a dream about it and she also met somebody who said, if you have a child, call him Muhammad before she was even pregnant. But the reality is that it was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because this name is written in the next world, from before the time that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu was born. It is mentioned in the books that come before, like uh, Ahmad. These, the, the name of the Rasul Sallallahu is present, um, written down on the throne of the, uh, the, in, the, in, in, in the Jannah. And that's been since Sayyidina Adam alayhi salam saw it. So uh, it's obvious that his name was written for him. And what is Muhammad? What is Hamada? We mentioned Hamd earlier. Phrase. Hamada, when you do Tahmid, is when you do something and action intensely. So Muhammad is one who is praised intensely. And he is known that he was, he's praised in the heavens and the earth, Messenger of Allah. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It's the same as Mahmud, but stronger. Mahmud means one who is praised. Muhammad means one who is praised intensely. 
this is the best and noblest of all the names of the Rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam. In fact, one of the men of Allah said that he, the messenger, Allah subhanahu wa taala has a thousand names, and the messenger, his messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam, has a thousand names. But this is the best of his names. Muhammad al Aqib. So the Aqib of something is the thing that comes at the end of it. So the final part of it. So the messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam is he? He said in a hadith that he was the Aqib. In fact. Which means he comes right at the end. There's no, nothing after him. The end of his time marks the time of the gathering. So he's the final, the final messenger, or the final prophet here, as he says. Well, he says messenger here, isn't he? He says, Al Aqibu li Rusli Rabbihi, the final one of the messengers, the ones who are sent with the messengers. His message is the final one. His shara, his law is the final one of his Lord, our Lord, the creator. The Murabbi, they say the word Rabb comes from Murabbi, the one who educates, the one who raises, the one who protects and sustains and looks after and looks out for. That's the Rabb. That's one of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Although it can also simply mean the creator. But this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the final one. There is no prophet and no messenger after him. This is known by the hadiths of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Also mentioned in the Quran, Muhammad, ma kana Muhammadu naba ahadim min rijalikum, walakin Rasul Allahi wa khatim al nabiin. Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is not the father of any of your boys. In other words, he didn't have male children alive. Ma kana Muhammad naba ahadim min rijalikum is not the the father of any of your men. Walakin, but Rasul Allah, he is the messenger of Allah, وخاتم النبيين, and the seal of the prophets. In other words, when you seal something, there's nothing that can come after it. This is the messenger of Allah, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. There's no messenger after him, no prophet after him. Muhammad, Muhammad al Aqib. So we say instead of Muhammadun, it's usually Muhammadun or Muhammadin, depending on whether you're saying it's. From Nabi, or it's a new sentence, but we've taken away the tanween because it doesn't fit the meter. So he did say, instead of saying Muhammadin here, he says Muhammadil Aqibu in Rusli Rabbihi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa hisbihi. So again, we're talking about the salat and the salam. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala salat and salam being on his al and his sah and his hisb. Now there's a difference of opinion about the meaning of these terms. Some people say the al refers to the family of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, so those who are related to him, and that would include his often also those who have been married to him, his wives, and then the sahab are those who met the messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam or saw the messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and believed in him while he was alive, and remained upon that belief until they themselves died. So long as they met the messenger of Allah Sallallahu during the period where he was a messenger, not when he met him in his youth and then. But that was one of the conditions of a sahaba. So that's the sahaba, and then the next one would be the hizb, which referred to the party, which would mean everybody who's a believer in Allah Subhanahu in, in in Allah Subhanahu wa Taala and following the way of his messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That's one perspective, but they also say that the al, and this is based on the hadith of the messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, refers to kullu taqi, everybody who has taqwa. Every believer is referred to as the Al of Muhammad. So the first part, then the Al, would mean the generality of the believers, the right acting among them, and even the wrong acting among them, so long as they have that iman in Allah and His Messenger. Then the Sahaba, the Sah refers to the Sahaba. So they are is is basing the general, then the more specific amongst them. And this is often a pattern in Arabic. You'll see the general mentioned first, and then he specifies a group from amongst the general for extra praise. And then a group from among them for extra praise. In which case, his would then mean the core of the messengers, of the core of the companions of the messengers of Allah. Mm -hmm. So those are the two ways they have described these two things. Obviously, the more conventional one is that al refers to family. They're, they're both possibilities. Wabadu fal ilmu bi din wabad. You often hear this whenever you go to a khutbah. Um, uh, bad. Part of the khutbah, they mention the preliminaries. 
and then in order to restart and move on from there to the to the topic at hand they use this term or bad or bad do after all of that basically after everything that's come before it's mabni al dam if you look at the grammatical of it it doesn't change from ba badu it's always badu if you say fi badu ala ba whatever it is if it's a it's an object or if it's a subject it's always badu mm. but in this case the wa here is also indicating that there is the amma is missing but is understood basically as for what follows and then this is now moving on to the topic we've done our preliminaries we've praised Allah and his messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam after doing that now we're going to do we move on to what this book is about what this work is about because you would do this those preliminaries for everything so where it will be different is this bit after bad whichever whichever thing you're doing comes here yeah so he says wabadu fal ilmu bi asl din muhtam knowledge certainty knowing for sure um of the asl of the deen this by this he's referring to the usul al din which is another name for the science of tawhid he doesn't say usul al din because it wouldn't fit the meter so the asl of something is like the trunk or the root so basically you have the trunk of a tree and from that trunk spring forth all of the furur all of the branches so the deen is this shara this 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 thing that the prophet sallallahu alaihi brought us the way to worship allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the way to live our lives that's the deen that none of it means anything none of it has is applicable until this asl this trunk is in place which is belief in allah and his messenger you could pray but if you don't believe in allah and his messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam that prayer is pretty is meaningless you could fast that, that fast is not is not is not doing anything for, for you it's not is not entering you into the garden and weighing heavily on your balance on the right actions it might lessen some of your wrong actions allah knows best but it doesn't have the effect of bringing the garden into a, making the garden a poss possibility or acceptance of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala a possibility until it's accompanied by the usul al-din which is this science knowing how to believe in allah knowing what you believe in allah hmm? so that says fal ilmu knowledge knowing for certain knowing what is true and what isn't of this thing of this thing muhtam is is a certainty is something which is an obligatory which is necessary for every muslim every mukallaf everybody who is adult um and and is sane muslim or not it's a requirement on every human being and every jinn every single one has to have ilm of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala this ilm does not have to be tough what they call tafsili you don't have to know all of the details it can be ijmali for example they give an example of this um an example of somebody says what's your proof for allah and you say the world that's that's a proof that's considered knowledge ijmali you know it you know what the world is and you know that that means there must be allah you've met your base criterion for knowing allah subhanahu wa in some ways but then if you go into the reason why everything in the world has a starting point everything in the world is contingent all that type of stuff and you can explain it in detail that's tafsili that's not necessary for every single individual but it is necessary that we keep this knowledge alive because it has to remain in order for us to protect this deen from these currents like we mentioned before so while every not every single muslim has to know all of those details they do have to know all of the attributes of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but they don't have to know the why of them but they do have to know them for certain some people have to know it at a more detail level which is why we have these types of classes where we can all learn together inshallah yahtaju lit tabyini so he says here it needs to be explained it requires exposition it needs why for it to be kept alive properly for people to understand 
this this matter, and also to counter these currents that I've talked about. They can only be countered if th there is some degree of exposition, of explanation of, of why these things must be so. And that's why he's mentioning it here. He's saying, well, this is why I've written this poem. <laughs> you know, is there's a need for this. Okay, not everybody has to know it at that level, but it has to be known at that level by some. And if, as he mentions here, in the next line, lakim min himamu, but because of it going to excessive lengths, the himmas of people, the resolve and the aspiration of people to embark upon learning this knowledge, becomes exhausted becomes tired, they don't want to do it. Their, their, their himma fails and weakens. So he says here, it has to be explained, but not with this lengthy exposition that has become so favorite amongst us, because everybody wanted to go into greater and greater depth to explain these things. He's saying, no, that's not what we need. We need something simple so people can get their teeth, in, their teeth into it something that's accessible to the masses, something that, you know, everybody can, can, can come and learn, not something that you have to be an absolute specialist who is prepared to wade through a, a thousand texts in order to, to, arrive at, to, to, to arrive at one particular point. That's not what we need. That's what he's saying here. Of course, there will be some who like to do that, not to say that those people shouldn't ever do it, but that's not what his purpose is in writing this. So he says here, because of this, فَصَارَ فِيهِ الْإِخْتِصَارُ مُلْتَزَمُ اختصار. You've heard of the مُخْتَصَرْ of Khalil. اختصار is summarizing or shortening or abridging or... But not in a way that removes the bits that are important. A good abridgment keeps everything that is important in there. Doesn't get, doesn't sacrifice any of it. It just moves, it removes the what you might call the fluff, the extras, the sort of things that aren't strictly speaking necessary. That's what Ikhtisar does. And he's saying, you know, this is necessary now. It's necessary for us to shorten this in order, and that's a multazam, that's become an ob obligation on us. We can't avoid not doing that. Because if we don't do this, it's in danger of being lost. That's what he's saying. And this work in front of you is Urjuza, is a poem in the meter of the Rajs. So when you look at didactic poems in Arabic, they traditionally use this particular format, easy to remember, but not always rhyming at the end, which was called Rajs. So it wasn't always one letter at the end, but they always had the same, each line always had the same meter. Um, and that was the format traditionally used for knowledge. So he says here, this is an orjuza. Um, this is this is for the purpose of explaining the science of tawhid. Laqabtuhu johar tawhidi. I gave it the laqab. You'll see this word mentioned in the Quran in Surah Hujurat. A laqab is like a name that a person gives to a thing, but it may not necessarily be its actual name, but it's the name that we give to something often translated as a nickname. So when you call something a laqab, he says, this is the name that I give it. So from my own perspective of what I know of it, this is the name I've assigned to it. So it's not claiming that this is what it is. He's saying, this is how I view it. This is, this is what, I, what, I, what, I, what I see of it. And he calls it Jawhara Tawheed. The Jawhara, a Jawhara is like a pearl or a ruby. Something of great value that is the, like a pearl, it's like the essence, the main part of that thing. But it's something that has great value attached to it. So he's talking about the different doctrines here, each one being extremely valuable. And also Joharas tend to be small and bite-sized. <laughs> so he's, he's calling it this in order to indicate that he's compiled all of these pearls and... Um, they're all accessible because they're they're short and they're they're in that they're, they're in that valuable form where there's a lot into a small into a small thing of tawhid of the science of tawhid of the science of unification making one of oneness of Allah subhanahu wa taala 
قد هذبتها I have sifted them So basically he's, he gives you the image here that all of these these pearls how did he arrive at these pearls well he had all of these sorts of dirt and the pearls were in the dirt and he sifted all of it out and all of the dirt and all of the sort of useless stuff has gone away by the, by that he means all of the misunderstandings the false doctrines the going to the length the explanations when they're not needed and the fluff none of that remains just the pearls have them to I I've I have sifted it refined it so I'll just do one more line today so we'll finish for this introduction to this wallah arju fil qabuli and Allah I hope for I hope for a for him for his acceptance so when you when you are when you put something first you mean that you hope for that thing and nothing else for example when we say in the fatiha iyyaka na'budu iyyaka you na'budu we worship what it means is we worship none but you so basically it's confining the worship to the one mentioned first similarly here wallah arju and allah i hope i place my hopes in allah not in anything else i don't have placed my hopes in the words that i'm going to use or in my own knowledge or my own understanding or whatever it is no i place all my hopes in allah subhanahu wa ta'ala il qabul that this will be accepted i hope that for acceptance for it and i hope that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will nafi an biha will bring benefit by it muridan fi thawabi tamian for those who seek benefit muridan who seek the the nafa and also who are tamian avid or greedy for or desirous of the thawab the reward so the reward of believing in allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, is what the jannah and we're often taught to in various hadith that is you know when we are asked for something for allah we have to be expectant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rewarding us for those things. I mean, there's different levels of ikhlas, which is sincerity. I mean, the lowest level of ikhlas is, 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 is doing things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reward you in some way in this world. For example, you do things because you want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to, to remove the difficulties situation that you're in. You ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the hoping that your situation in this world and, that, and you attach importance to, to to the outcome in this world that's that's one form of ikhlas the second form of ikhlas which is the one he's referring to here is that you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala expectant of something in the next world but nothing relating nothing necessarily in this world that he will remove the punishment for, from you in the next world and will give you a high station in the next put you in the garden you're, you're hoping for the garden that's fine it's acceptable the highest thing is to do it purely because you're a slave of Allah and that's what he wants to do no desire of any reward purely to, to please Allah and to do what he wants of you because you're his slave so the, the, the men of knowledge have talked about this talk about the different levels of ikhlas but he mentions this here to show you there's not a problem it's fine in fact it's it's better it's, it's the, the middle way of ikhlas to actually do something for the reward no, 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 there's nothing wrong with that. So, um, is there any questions before we finish for today? This is purely an introduction today. We're going to actually start on, with the next line on the topic properly. Any questions here? No? No one online? Well, Bismillah, so same time next week, inshallah. The week after next could well be one of the days of Eid. So uh, I'm not sure what we'll do on that day, but it's probably going to be either the second or the third day of Eid. So it might be possible. Have to see, inshallah. Anyway, until next week. Assalamu wa barakatuh. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillahir Rabbil Alamin. Ar Rahmanir Rahim. Maliki Yawm Al Din. Iyaka Nabudu wa Iyaka Nasta'in. Ihdina Sirat al Mustaqim. Sirat al Ladin Anam Taalihim wa Al Mabdubi Alihim wa Ladin. Amin. Allahumma Salli ala Sayyidina Muhammadin Abdika wa Rasulika Nabiyyuni wa Ala Alihi wa Sahbihi wa Salim Taslima. Subhana Rabbika Rabbil Azzatim wa Sifum wa Salamun Musalim. Alhamdulillahir Rabbil Alamin.
see you next time inshallah assalamu alaikum